a blessed Sabbath. It's good to be in our Father's house. I'm delighted to be with you today and to recognize the special faith of your pastor. I mean, she has to be a woman of great faith to bring a non-theologian and a non-preacher to give a sermon to you today. So I'm just very pleased to be with you. My title today is Mad, Sad, Glad. The Gospel of Second Chance. Now, I have to tell you that I will not be preaching to you about health. Now, I suspect this may make some of you mad and some of you sad and most of you are glad. So, <clears throat> but actually, to set the record straight, I do plan to talk about health, but in a different way than you perhaps expected. I want to dig a little deeper than what we usually do when we talk about health. When we talk about health, we talk about health habits. We talked about the idea that most of our health is largely determined by what we do to ourselves and with ourselves. The choices that we make, the foods that we choose, the site that we set aside for exercise, the time that we set aside for spiritual contemplation, the hours of sleep that we set aside to rest up. And so when we think about it for a moment, I think most of us have to admit that we know better than we do. And so I thought as we begin this new year, perhaps we can begin to talk about how can we get motivated? How can we do better? How can we do what we know we should be doing and do it in a gentle, loving way? And so this morning, I want to perhaps look for some inspiration. And that inspiration, surprisingly, is coming from the Los Angeles Kings hockey team. This hockey team played 44 years without ever winning a national championship. This hockey team did everything they could. No, they didn't. Because they never had the glorious moment where they held the famous and coveted Stanley Cup in their hands. Never. Until something happened. They got a new trainer. They got a new coach. And it seemed that he knew how to motivate these people how to motivate these players to do their best, how to have a solid goal in mind to become the champion of that year, an all-consuming goal to becoming, at last, a winner with the Stanley Cup in hand. And it actually happened. It happened the very next year, in the year 2012. The Los Angeles Kings were the champions of the National Hockey League for the first time. And what made the difference? 40 years, nothing. One year, success. What made the difference? A new trainer, a new coach, a man who was in charge and who was admired and trusted. Now, we don't have to end up with the Los Angeles Kings. The same is true for corporations. A new CEO can make all the difference in turning a poorly performing company around. The same is true for schools. Sometimes a new principal can turn the school around. <clears throat> what about God? What about God? getting a better and clearer picture and a better understanding about our God 
Could that make a difference? Falling in love with him all over again? Could that make a lot of difference? A difference in how we choose our values? How we choose our priorities? How we choose our lifestyle? How we honor him? Could that affect us in our daily living habits? So let us pray. Our Father, make me a nail upon the wall, and from this nail so small, may we see a bright picture of God the Father. Amen. So this morning, as you probably gathered, I want to talk about God. I want to talk about my father. I want to talk about God who he is. And I want to do this by looking at the parable of the prodigal son. Well, you know the story. It's found in Luke 15. It's a story about an extravagant and wasteful son. But my emphasis this morning is not so much to be on the son as it be on the prodigal father of that son. So let me give you some backdrop to understand the parable of the prodigal son as I understand it. Jesus. Jesus is approaching the end of his life. His ministry is coming to an end. And he's becoming increasingly concerned. He knows his time is running out. His ministry is coming to an end. And the question haunts him, how can I, how can I, who has been with the Father from the very beginning of the world, how could I at this time now, how can I fulfill my purpose of letting the world know, letting the people know what my Father is really like? And now Jesus increasingly begins to talk in parables. Now, parables are lessons. Parables are illustrations of universal applicability. People at every level can understand uh, parables, illustrations. The simplest of peasants could understand the meaning of, 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 of a parable. And the highest trained theologians, 2,000 years later now, are still mining the depth of these treasures that Jesus presented to us in the parables. And of course, you know that when Jesus came, the times were dark. You see, God the Father, over the years, had received a lot of bad press. His image as a father, a concerned father, had been distorted. He no longer was the loving, concerned father, but now he was seen by many people as a bloodthirsty, vindictive tyrant. The ultimate, ever-present, extreme vigilante meeting out justice to people who didn't follow his rules. The celestial accountant that was keeping track of the misdeeds of his people so that he could mete out justice to them. And so over time, the picture of God had become totally distorted, no longer the loving, concerned father, but now perceived as a bloodthirsty, arbitrary God, a capricious God, a malevolent bully, And then, in the fullness of time, comes Jesus. Jesus always comes when the time is right, if we are ready. And so now Jesus increasingly is talking in parables, trying to reach people everywhere to 
create the proper picture, to restore the picture of God as a loving father. And so we find in Luke 15, those three well-known parables. You know the parables of the lost sheep. 100 sheep are entrusted to a shepherd. 99 are safe. One is lost. But the good shepherd pursues the lost sheep. When he finds it, he calls for a party in heaven for the lost sinner who has found his way home. And then the second parable, the lost coin. Here again, Jesus talks about 10 valuable coins, nine are safe, one is lost, and he describes a woman who is taking her lamp, her candle, and she sweeps every corner in the house to find that one coin, and when she finds it, she goes to her name and says, I found it! And Jesus says, similarly, that's what happens up there in heaven. The rejoicing of one lost sinner that has lo found his way back home. And then, of course, to make the point and drive it home, Jesus talks about the best known of all of his parables, the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son. You know the story well. So let me just capture it in a few uh, para paragraphs here. You have a young son. He lives in a comfortable home. He's born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He lives a good life. He has everything he wants and more. He has a father who instructs him how to live the principles of success. But he also teaches the boy how to live the principles of similarity. A lot of difference between principles of success and significance. You see, success oftentimes relates to material well-being, accumulation of things. Similarity talks more about meaning and purpose and ministering to others, serving others. Significance has to do with living the best life possible. And the best life possible is to give to others. To live, really live, is to give. And so the father is trying to help this boy to understand, but after a while, as he goes to the university, things begin to change, and he increasingly begins to question his father's um, concepts. He increasingly begins to question the parental teaching that he hears. And he begins to think about this. Why is it that I don't drive a BMW sports car when I go to, to the university? All the other students have cars. We have the money. Why is it that I have to be home for a curfew time when the university students all start the good life at that hour? Why? Why all this discipline? Why all this emphasis on responsible living? There are just restraints and controls and rounds of do's and don'ts. No more rules. I need to get out of this thing here. I want freedom. I need freedom. He wants liberty. No more shackles of restraint. No more control. And with resentments over his father's discipline growing, in a moment of anger, in a moment of madness, he storms into his father's library and he says, Dad, nothing personal, but I want to have my share of the estate now. What he's saying is, Father, you are in my way. You, you have to get out of my way. I want my money now. I want freedom. I want liberty. I want to live my life. No, the father could have been saying, well, listen, Sonny, <laughs> we have some Jewish regulations here when it comes to inheritance. Just buzz off. He didn't. He was a wise father. He understood that he couldn't stop this young man who had come to the point where he was very headstrong. He needed to have his way. And as a very wise father, he knew he had to let go. Let him reap the the, the, the results 
of his actions. Let him understand. Let him learn the lessons of life. But this father, he was very, very kind. And so with a very heavy heart, this wise man calls in his lawyer and says, sign the papers that I want to turn over to my son. He's getting one-third of the estate that we have right now. And the Bible says, a few days later, the son turned it into cash. He packed his bags and took a trip to a distant land. I mean, imagine this young man. He gets his driver's license. He gets his coveted BMW sports car. And with money in his pockets, he leaves his home to go to distant land. A distant land away from the father. Away from the father's home. Away from responsibility. Away from being watched over. Freedom. I want to do it my way. No more annoying advice. No more being called into responsible living. No more control. Only freedom and license. Typical things that we experience between generations. It's always like that. And in the distant land now, he grabs all the gusto he can, he can grab. He grabs all the pleasures he can find. Proms, parties, and easy girls. Free at last to do what he wants to do. He does it all. Riotous living. Until. Until his money runs out and his BMW is being impounded and his friends are gone. He's penniless. He's broke. The party is over. Once a young, arrogant man storming into his father's library, I want it now. Now, destitute, despairing, And finally finding a job. A job to take care of pigs. The ultimate insult for a Jewish boy. He's hungry. He's starving. And now he's looking at those pigs. Because after all, these pigs have their husks. And these husks began to look good to him. Once again, an arrogant hulk of a man, now destitute and despairing, from madness to sadness, from mad to sad. Now, eventually, the Bible says this, but he came to a census, and the turnaround begins. The light is being turned on. He begins to see because he remembers his childhood. He remembers his father. He remembers his mother. She would read him Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories at night. Yeah. He remembers. The goodness is imprinted on his brain. It's there. It was done as he was a child. He remembers and he remembers the comfortable home. He remembers the food. He remembers the glory of the home that he had. He remembers the sermons, the servants. It's all there. And the slides are on. When he finally came to a census. Yes. But I think it is more than just thinking about the um, material benefits that the house would present to him and offer him. No, it was the goodness 
of the parental home, imprinted, remembering. He came to his senses and he said, I am going home. And he got up. He got up. Sometimes we need to be on our backs so we can look up and see the goodness of God. Sometimes we have to be defrocked before we can realize how good we have it. Sometimes we have to be everything that is important to us, which made us then self-sufficient and oftentimes arrogant. Sometimes we need to have, yeah, we need to have that heart attack. Sometimes we have to have that diabetes. Sometimes we have to have the diagnosis by a physician. You are overweight. No, you are obese. You need to do something about it. Sometimes we need a call to action. He got up. And things began to change. And he begins to turn his feet towards the home. And the Bible says, while he was still a long distance away, his father saw him coming. And when he saw him, his heart was pounding and filled with loving pity, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. Folks, this is not a bloodthirsty tyrant. This is not a capricious, vindictive father. This is not an ever-present vigilante who confronts his son, and what did you do with all that money I gave you? How did you squander it? How did you learn, did you finally learn your lesson? No. A good, loving, concerned father. You see, here's a father sitting on the porch day after day, scanning the horizon for his son. I mean, in his heart of hearts, he knows that his son must be coming back any time. He's expecting him to come back because this is blood of my blood. This is DNA of my DNA. This is my bone. That's his bone. And so he sits on the porch day after day, month after month, year after year. And now he has become an old man. They have to lift him on the porch now. He has arthritis. He has to wear a cane. He can no longer see very well. Glaucoma has taken over. He doesn't remember things very well. He has become an old man. Poor old man. And as he scans the horizon, he sees, he recognizes this bit of pitiable humanity that's coming around the bend in the road. It is my son, my son, my son. Oh, fathers and mothers, listen to me. You don't see with your eyes or your glasses. As a father and mother, you see with your heart. And with your heart, you always have a 20-20 vision for your son, for your child, for your children. And he forgets his arthritis. He forgets that he is legally blind. And he gets off the, the, the porch. And his limp feet begin to move faster than he can ever remember. And they move into the direction of his son. And his heart is pounding and filled with pity. And then they embrace my son, my son, father, father. He wants to make a confession. But in the face of an exuberant father, his mind goes blank. Without a shirt on his back. His father covers his poverty with his robe of righteousness. And he covers his son's grief with his unconditional love. And then the father shouts to his servants, quick, quickly, bring in the finest robe and put it on him and a jeweled ring on his finger and shoes. These are the symbols of being reinstated into the family. We must celebrate for this son of mine who was dead. He is alive. Let us celebrate. From a moment of madness to a moment of sadness to a celebration of gladness. Mad, glad, sad. The gospel of second chance. 
This is not the story of a prodigal son. It's the wrong title. This is the story of a prodigal father. This is the story. God does not wait for human repentance and reformation before extending his mercy. Oh, no. His mercy is always extended joyfully and lavishly prior to any moral transformation. As we accept God as a loving God, as a loving Father, His mercy takes over and we begin to respond in a new and different lifestyle. We become motivated to honor the God that deserves our honor. It is then that we become transformed in response to seeing the love of God for us. Here are his affirmations. One more. He said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And he says, I have tattooed your name on the palms of my hand. You are before me forever. You have ravished my heart. I've given everything that matters to me, even my own son. You are mine. And I want to be your loving father. Are we ready to claim him as our loving father? Are we ready to let him claim us as his children? He's waiting on the porch for all of us. A father characterized by incredible faithfulness. I'm Pastor Tara Van Cross, and we're so glad that you've tuned into our Azure Hills Church YouTube channel. Please like and subscribe, and click on the bell so that you'll be notified every time we share new videos. We are so glad that you're here. Until next time, please know that we're praying for you as you continue to be a voice of hope.